Shalom to each of you here on the Zoom call and those who will watch this class lecture on YouTube later. Our usual program during these talks is to conduct an overview of the Bible section in the first 20, 25 minutes or so, and then let everyone on the call into a conversation about all the themes or ideas that I'll bring up during the last half hour. And then further discussion happens. Hopefully you'll do that in your discipleship groups, maybe even have one on Shabbat. I'm going to recommend that you who are watching this on YouTube should read the next Bible section before you listen and watch the rest of this. Please read chapters 18 and 19 of Joshua. Then press play on your machine and rejoin us. Thanks. Welcome back. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please click that, um, that button, the red, the red subscribe button. Would you do that? below this video and join us and also click like if you don't mind. That way we will reach more folks like you down the road. I know this is the first time we're going to look at two chapters during our study, but be assured we'll be faithful in delivering to you the full meaning of the text today, or at least we'll try. We begin at chapter 18 verse 1 and I want to let you see a famous idiom and you will see its roots. Here we see three phrases, the whole congregation gathering and the Ohel Moed being set up and the land was subdued before them. Those three phrases all say a significant amount. First, the whole congregation. That tells me the author is thinking in religious terms. It's not the leaders of the tribes, which could sound military. It's not all the tribes, which would sound political. It's congregation, a dot, the witnesses, which strikes a chord in my ears of religion. So he's saying that this is a religious gathering, and that is a very important thing to note after 17 chapters of everything else. Then we see that they are at Shiloh. That's the first capital of the new federation. That's the center of religion and worship. That's where they sent up the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting. When I was a kid, saying the word Ohel in Hebrew, in Hebrew school, was a lot of fun. Uh, it could get away with saying something dirty, but it just means the tent of meeting. And it's significant on many levels. The worship of God would be the centering for the people of God. Without worship and sacrifices, without offerings and prayers, were merely a club, a mob, a political entity, the Kiwanis or the Rotarians. It's not the people of God are coming, said the nations whom we conquered. It's God who is coming with his people. That's what the seven nations would cry. Our strength and our life, our help and our significance comes from God. He alone is our expression of life. He alone is our sustenance. He's our strength, our shield, our buckler, our strong tower. So without worship and the center point of that worship, the Ohel Moed, we're only a nation. With him were the chosen nation, the people of God anointed and equipped to do his will. And we are at Shiloh, not Jerusalem, not yet. Then the third phrase is that the land was subdued. The Hebrew for subdued is kavash. Do you know the expression, the idiom, to put the kavash on? That phrase, according to the dictionary, means to stop or end something, to prevent something from happening or continuing. Like the expression, his mother put the kavash on his smoking habit. Well, that's exactly what the meaning here is in verse 1 the land was subdued. Now that's not the first time it's used in the Bible. Early on in Genesis chapter 1, we see in verse 28, God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, peru or vu, and fill the earth and kabash it, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue. Make it prevented from overtaking you. 
you overtake it, you rule over it, you make it subservient. So here in verse one, the land is subdued. Obviously that includes the people of the land. It's under control. You put the kibosh on the land. Well done, Israel and the 12 tribes. Verse two says, now the final seven will get their apportionment. Now the first five, we already saw two and a half tribes, Reuben, God, and Chatzim Manasha over on the east of the Jordan. And then uh, two weeks ago, we saw J uh, Judah and then Ephraim and then the other half of Manasha. So we've got five tribes already apportioned their place. Now the other seven, one here in chapter 18 and six in chapter 19, these are all sons of Jacob and each one will get theirs. There is one son of Jacob who doesn't get anything and that's Levi, but that's because he already had some cities and he received the priesthood, but he has no stationary land distributed. Verse three, Joshua tells the people to get it done. He says, basically, the day is dawning. It's time for you to get all the other seven. Everybody should have their place. In fact, I see this whole episode as the dawning of a new era in Israel. Look, if you can write down Deuteronomy 12, the first 11 or 12 verses says this. I'll just read highlights of Deuteronomy 12. These are commandments from God through Moses. These are the statutes and the judgments which you shall carefully observe in the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess as long as you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and burn their asherim with fire. And you shall cut down the engraved images of their gods and obliterate their name from that place. You shall not act like this toward the Lord your God, but you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling. And there you shall come. Skip down to verse eight. You shall not do at all what we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes, for you have not as yet come to the resting place and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. When you cross the Jordan and live in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around you so that you live in it securely or live in security, then it shall come about that the place in which the Lord your God will choose for his name to dwell, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hand, and all your choice votive offerings, which you shall vow to the Lord. Verse 12, 12, 12. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who's within your gates, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. What God said then through Moses and the people under Joshua are now doing is to fulfill this. But, but get this, it's only a first step. Uh, I like to think of it as a down payment on the new thing that God will do. In other words, Shiloh, it's not the end. It's the place where God said, put my name. So they set up the Ohel Moed and there you go. But that's not the end. Later on in Jewish history, we know that the capital moved under David to Jerusalem. But even that's not the end, no matter what happened in uh, 2018 with Donald Trump in Jerusalem. That, that's not the end. What is? Zechariah says there's coming another place at another time in chapter 14. And there, Jerusalem will be split from north to south with that earthquake. And there will be no light, he says. The world will change in a heartbeat. A new day again will arise. Isaiah said that. He saw that day in his prophecy. In chapter 25 of Isaiah, 
He says that God would wipe away every tear, no more crying, no more death. I believe that. I just don't understand it. The more I know, the more tears I get. The more I know about the pains of the world and the suffering of people in my neighborhood or in, in Sudan, the more I see about the pains of suffering in Ukraine or in South, uh, South Miami, wherever it is, to hear and read that there will be no more death and no more tears. I believe it. I totally believe it. I believe that God will make that happen, but I don't know how he's going to do it. Thankfully, he doesn't need my permission nor my authorization nor my accomplishment to make it happen. I just long for that day. John the Revelator saw that new day in chapter 21 in his vision with a new heaven and a new earth, again, no more tears, no more death. Death swallowed up forever. No more lake, no more oceans. That doesn't mean he hates the Tasman Sea. What it means is, in pictorial version, darkness and death and sin come from the lake in Revelation. The beast rises up out of the lake in Revelation. So there's no sin, not just no sin in the world. Get this, brothers and sisters, no sin in you or me. What a day of rejoicing that'll be, the newest of new days. Are you looking for that day? I, I certainly am. Now, God wants the seven nations to get theirs. Uh, so he distributes them, one here in chapter 18 and six, as I say, in chapter 19. So no Israelite is left out. This teaches that all Israel has a place. No one is left out. I think of elitism and professionalism that has crept into the community of faith, and I'm scandalized. We need each person to make it into the new heaven. Bring each other along. Maybe that's what we're doing in our Zoom call. Maybe that's what we do in our discipleship and home and connect groups. Help to bring others along and then let others bring you along. <laughs> no person from Dan can say to the Ephraimite, I have no need of you. No Simeonite can reject his brother from Issachar because oh, they're not from Simeon. We need one another. The body of Messiah is a continuity of this people of God theme. And the many tribes, one nation motif will be highlighted throughout Jewish history and to this day. In verse three, Joshua says, how long will you put off entering to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers has given you? He's chiding Israel, perhaps all 12 tribes, but certainly the seven by saying, you are slack. Now it says in the Hebrew, kind of a, I'm sorry, in the English, a gentler word, how long will you put off? The Hebrew is rafa, not the same word as healing. To hang limp, to sink down, to be feeble, to be lazy, to lower, discourage, to leave alone, to abandon, withdraw, to show oneself slack. <laughs> how long will you be slackers, he's saying. It's the same word that's used at the beginning of the book of Joshua in chapter one, where God promises he will not be slack towards us. He will not, he, I think it, it's translated, he won't drop us or be slack concerning us. Look, I, I love football, whatever code it is. I go to games when I can out here in Sydney to see the Swans in the AFL. Um, yesterday, I even looked at my schedule in the United States in late autumn to see if I can organize to go see the Kansas City Chiefs. They are ever my team. And thankfully the Chiefs and the Swans both have red and white in their jer jerseys, so I don't have to change uniform. But when I go and I, and I watch the, uh, the contest unfold, it comes down to just such, usually they're very close games. 
and it's how close it gets to the very end when someone kicks the ball. And in the AFL, if you catch it, then you have permission and you get freedom to kick another one forward without anybody bothering you. But if you drop the ball, then it's fair game. Anybody can get it. Dropping the ball, that's not good in sport. And it's not good in um, this divine notion. God says, I won't do that. I won't drop you, Israel. So Joshua now tells the Jewish people that it's not a divine characteristic. It's not what we should be doing. We should keep, keep catch the ball. We should keep our hand, in, in Yeshua's terms, keep our hand to the plow until the job is done. Get it done. Keep focused. Learn and walk with God and do what he says right then. Butler, whom I read often on, in his teaching about Joshua, highlights it this way. Verse 3 continues this thought by addressing all Israel. He says, not just the seven tribes. The first words of the address are totally unexpected. They lament the laziness and lack of courage displayed by Israel. The position at the beginning of the context and the unexpected content show that this is central to the message of the section. Butler says, Israel is told that possession of land depends on her activity and courage. No one can blame Yahweh, he says, if Israel does not have her land. Yahweh has given it to her, end quote. I like what H.L. Ellison says in his commentary on Joshua in this section. He's speaking about this take possession thing. That's It's ours by right, but we have to work to get it done. And he uses the imagery that Yeshua uses, my yoke is easy. It sounds great, right? But a yoke is an instrument of work that attaches two animals to one another for the sake not of rest, you take the yoke off to rest, but of working together. Yeshua says in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ellison says this, quote, The slackness blamed by Joshua may well have been due to an unwillingness to settle down. It was fine to have a promised land, but the reality showed the need for learning new skills and engaging in hard work. That is, for many, the disappointing side of God's gifts. They're always given that we may serve the better. Even his rest is linked with a yoke, end quote. So off go the 21 men, three from each of the seven tribes, to scout and to write up reports on the land. They return, and Joshua distributes the seven tribes with their due. The precision is as before, one city, one border, one line, one river, along that path, and on and on it goes. And God is to be the center. Look, three times after the 21 go, then they write up their journals and they, they say that this is, uh, look at it, verse 6, 8, and 10. It says that this is before the Lord. It's not just a journal of surveying. It is a surveying of God's land. He's to be the reason and the end result. And the seven tribes get theirs. Then finally, look at verses 49 and through 51 of chapter 19. When they finished apportioning the land for inheritance by its borders, the sons of Israel gave an inheritance in their midst to Joshua, the son of Nun. In accordance with the command of the Lord, they gave him the city for which he asked, Timnath Serah in the hill country of Ephraim. So he built the city and settled in it. These are the inheritances which Eleazar the priest and Yoshua the son of Nun and the heads of the households of the tribes of the sons of Israel distributed by Lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the doorway of the Ohel Moed. So they finished dividing the land. I like that individuals and tribes both got theirs. And do you remember in the distribution of the land that the first one to get anything and physically settle was Caleb. And remember, Caleb and Joshua were the two fellows who brought back the good report, the minority report, 
back when they left the, the wilderness in the book of Numbers. And they went out along with the other 10 spies and they came back and said, we can take it. <laughs> so Caleb first and Joshua last are bookends to the distribution. Also, there were the daughters of Tzalofachad who got theirs, Joshua gets his, and each of the 12 tribes, everyone gets theirs. No one should be left out, even you even your family, even your Jewish neighbors, and your Gentile neighbors. No one who is promised land should fail to receive it. The new day is dawning. The newest of new days is coming. What will you do to inherit God's kingdom? Yeshua taught us to enter the kingdom of God. One thing was required, be born again. And he said, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Dear friends, have you been born again? Do you look forward to that eternal day when there's no longer any night or lake or sin or death, when there's no more tears, when there's no death to exist because the Lamb of God has conquered and given us his territory? Do you know that Yeshua initiated that new covenant on Passover nearly 2,000 years ago? Have you met the one who was cursed on the Roman tree for you in Jerusalem? If you've never asked Yeshua to be your savior today, as we keep learning from Joshua, would you choose to believe the Lord of life? Would you be willing to take a stand for him who took a stand and died on a Roman cross for you? Yeshua in his death, accomplished salvation for all people. He took the curse we deserved to give us his righteousness, which he deserved. Forgiveness is available because of the death of our Messiah. If you'd like to receive him today, right where you are, just now, join me as we pray. Say something like this. Father, in Yeshua's name, forgive me my sin. I was wrong to disbelieve in you and to dismiss you. I need your mercy. I deserve punishment, but you are kind and merciful and I receive your grace. I repent. I receive Yeshua as my Savior and Lord. I'll live because of my faith in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you write me? There's the address on the screen, bob at jewsforjesus.org.au. We'd love to hear from you if you have a question, a thought, an argument, uh, anything you'd like to say, we'll, we'll be glad to hear it and we'll be glad to respond. And we're delighted you've joined us today. Please join us next week and learn with the others how you can stay on track this year and beyond. I hope to see you next week as we continue our studies in Joshua. You'll, I think, see yourself in the readings and in the lessons. Next week, we'll look at chapter 20 in what I call Provisions, part one. And we'll see what lessons we can draw for ourselves from the scenes there. Hope to see you then. Until then, Shabbat Shalom.